like to introduce uh, our moderator, Liz Shorten, Chief Operating Officer, CMPA, who is leading this conversation. And so, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here today. And Liz, I will let you take it from here. Thanks, Melanie. Hello, everyone. Um, Glad you could join us today for this uh, hopefully interesting conversation about intellectual property. One of my favorite topics, one of the favorite topics of the CMPA, uh, always really important to talk about content and um, owning it, monetizing it, and hopefully we can get into um, some great strategies today. We've got a really varied group of panelists uh, with different business models, different perspectives, and um, I did, uh, while doing a bit of research into, I know most of the folks, but didn't know everybody. So I went on to LinkedIn and some of their websites. So as I introduce them, uh, I'm gonna just share a little bit about uh, what I was ever able to discover about their companies. Um, first, I'll introduce Aaron Levitz from Wattpad Studios. Aaron is the head of, of the studios and Wattpad um, is where original stories live. Uh, Wattpad Studios has transformed how the in entertainment industry finds its next great idea. Next up is our other Aaron, Aaron Finley, who is a partner at Stonehay. Stonehay is recognized as one of the leading entertainment law firms in Canada that focuses on entertainment, digital media, technology, marketing, and intellectual property law, of which Aaron is an, uh, one of our experts. Vinay Vermani, who's Chief Content Officer at Uninterrupted, Uninterrupted is a creative, in, uh, valuable creative endeavor and platform that empowers athletes to share their unique stories and authentic experiences with an audience that's ready to be inspired. And finally, Ray Mendoza, who's founder and CEO of Mad Ruck Entertainment. And I love this mission, creating cool shit with talented people to entertain, influence and impact culture through media, entertainment and technology. So that's a diverse group for sure. And just to kick us off, um, I had asked Erin Finley if she would uh, just share her thoughts on intellectual property IP, um, differentiating that perhaps from copyright, um, and then we'll get into um, more discussion about strategy and, and everybody's uh, different business model. Is that okay, Erin? Works for me. Thanks, Liz. And, and thanks to the Academy. And as soon as I said that, I was like, I'm really excited for the first time in my life to say thank you to the Academy. So thanks for inviting me. And uh, thanks to Melanie for organizing it and for the CMPA for sponsoring this, uh, this discussion. I think it's really an interesting one. Just as a bit of background about intellectual property, I think in terms of what most of us do, uh, we usually think about copyright. That's one piece of intellectual property and, and the one where I spend most of my, my life and my time in. Um, copyright protects literary, artistic, dramatic, and musical works, as well as a few other other things in there. Um, and basically, copyright gives authors of those works um, the right to authorize the reproduction or various uses of their works for a certain period of time. So copyright generally is lasts for between 50 to 70 years after the date of the death of the author. So it's quite a long, long tail. Copyright has quite a, a long runway. Um, compare that with trademarks, which is another basket of intellectual property rights. Trademarks protects brands, essentially. Um, in order to have a trademark that you can protect, typically we would recommend you register your trademark. And in order to get a trademark, um, must be distinct, not confusing, and you must demonstrate that it's actually in use at the time that you apply for your, your trademark. So trademarks we usually think about in terms of protecting a brand or a brand name, there's word marks, there's design marks, things like that. But if your business is becoming successful or you have a, a property that's becoming really successful and you wanna trade off of that brand name, you would wanna have protection in the copyright, um, sorry, in the trademark. And then uh, usually the third one we talk about most often would be patents, patents protect inventions. Um, I think that's probably a conversation for another day, or at least for another lawyer, not my universe. Um, but those are kind of the three, the three buckets we think about when we talk about intellectual property as that bucket of rights. Great. Um, so why don't we talk uh, at the beginning here about um, the importance of IP and owning that and monetizing it to each of your business models. And maybe I'll start with 
uh, Aaron Levitz at WAPAD, um, you know, thoughts on your strategy and perhaps how it's changed over time? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, for those of you who aren't as familiar with WAPAD, WAPAD started as the world's largest uh, social network for readers and writers. So we have about 80 million people coming every month to connect around stories being written by our writers who come from all over the world, all kinds of backgrounds, all different uh, stories and genres being told. Um, and we started the studio based on that IP, but not just that this was IP that you could find in a drawer somewhere in LA, but IP that had built-in audiences, a fandom around it, fandom telling us what they liked about that story with commenting down to the paragraph level. Um, and then, you know, the ability to look at the data that came from that audience behind it. So our IP strategy day one was find stories that audiences love and see if we can get them adapted. Um, and the, the crux of that hasn't changed. Our mantra continues to be to entertain the world with those data-driven stories. But I think what we've adapted to is understanding global markets and how audiences look at some of the biggest hits on Wattpad, something like a She's With Me with hundreds of millions of reads around the world, or being able to key in in specific geographies to service some of our local partners like you know, MediaCorp in Singapore, where you know, slow dancing is something that we're, we're producing there. So it really has changed from just looking at the biggest stories to understanding what stories work regionally, uh, understanding how genres fit into that, but then actually going a little further, and maybe this goes to some of the other IP that we're, we're not gonna talk about, Aaron, but really using machine learning to understand the context of stories in ways that have never been possible before. So our whole mantra has been around understanding IP better. Why? Because when we do produce it for screens everywhere, we want audiences to show up and give it a better chance of success night one. Really interesting. Ray, what about you? What's, uh, what's your strategy at Madruck? Well, Mad Madruck was actually born as a service production company for brands and for music. It really grew within the music space, majority music videos. We transitioned into do, doing branded content and then brands started, you know, uh, requesting for our service to work with the artists that we have relationships with. So it's been primarily for service, but then we're like, look, we have, you know, connection to subcultures, you know, strong connections within the music industry. We have a roster of great creatives Let's start leveraging that and developing our own IP. And as technology evolves and there's so many new platforms out there, we started, you know, thinking of ways to develop IP, leveraging our, you know, network of, of influence and uh, continue storytelling, just not for a brand or just for a music in which the brand typically owns the content, the musician or the label typically owns that intellectual property, but we've started um, developing some stuff internally. And uh, it started off with the 410, kudos to uh, one of my partners, Matt Power and, and Sue Binder Rich. And uh, we have a few other developments in the works, but it's just hacking the different platforms that are out there um, and that people are consuming more. And Vinay, you've, uh, I know at prime time, is that this year, last year you talked about, uh, yeah, this year. Um, your new venture uninterrupted and um which is again another unique uh strategy so maybe share a little bit yeah. about uh, what you've been up to well we're really proud that uh uninterrupted canada is the first expansion of the uninterrupted brand from the u.s which is founded by um lebron james uh of course in 2015 and it was founded when uh i believe it was fox news that told lebron to just shut up and dribble and, um, and, and, and at that point, LeBron being the pioneer that he is said, okay, uh, I want to create a platform for athletes where they feel safe, where they feel secure, where they can tell their story. And that's how uninterrupted was kind of created. And, um, you know, how we approach content at uninterrupted is even though we are a content studio, we are a athlete empowerment brand. First and foremost, we're about the empowerment of athletes and we're about the empowerment of people. So really, whether it's creatives, athletes, whoever it is, they are, they are our partners. So the IP is essentially built in from a very authentic insight right from the start. Um, and an example of that, for example, is we just did a fashion series with um, Sergi Baca, 
where Serge Ibaka takes athletes uh, shopping and gives them fashion makeovers. Now that was an idea that he had that he had a lot of success with like a cooking show. He says, now I want to do a fashion show. So we teamed up with him. We jointly owned the IP together. We shot it. We aligned a sponsor. We make sure that the sponsors don't have any ownership of the IP that that stays with us. So we treat our talent like our partners just from the get go. Um, in our business model at uninterrupted, we sort of have three different tiers of um, content. So branded content, um, just great stories that we want to tell just simple like um, digital uh, short form pieces and then long form um, mini series documentaries. And uh, just last year, we signed a seven year, de seven year deal with Bell Media, which has amplified our audience tremendously. So uninterrupted Canada, all of our content now lives on the Bell Media platforms. So that's just a general gist of what we do. So it's hard to know in this virtual world uh, who's out there in terms of the audience, but I, I would presume there's some newbies, uh, new, whether creators or producers out there. And you guys have just talked about very sophistic, sophisticated strategies, but um, you know, do you have any advice um, these days from what you've learned um, as you get into this business uh, around IP, what, uh, you know, how to uh, maintain, how to retain, um, you know, ownership and because um, there's cer certainly lots of pressure from what I hear um, from various buyers to, um, to give up that IP uh, because everybody knows that's where that's where the money is. So, uh, Aaron, any thoughts for people who are uh, emerging in the business or, um, you know, at a, at a, at a early stage? Um, I'm going to borrow something that Vinay said, actually, which is um, make sure you're a partner. Um, you know, when we're working with our creators, the, the, the you know, people who've written the stories that we're basing our adaptations on, whether it's we're publishing it as a book, whether it's going to, you know, theaters as theatrical release, not today, uh, or whether it's going as a streaming series. Um, IP is important because of built-in fan bases. I mean, it's why we are inundated with sequels and prequels and pre-sequels and whatever we call them now. So if you're going to go out there and create something original, you're doing it because there are people who know that IP. Um, and so if you're not partnering with the creator, you're going to miss the nuances of that. Now, we're pretty lucky in the sense of what bad has access to what audiences love about a story, but it doesn't mean we're not working with the creator throughout the process, you know, and locking them out of, you know, the, de the development room, the writer's room um, is a mistake that's been made in entertainment globally forever, where you take a book off a shelf, for example, and give it to a bunch of writers, say, adapt this, and let's see what comes out the other side. So we want those creators involved the whole time. We want the audience mm -hmm. involved in all times uh, at mo at, as much as we can um, throughout the production process all the way through to marketing it. And because of that, you want partners in those creators. Like you don't want to make them, you know, okay, you did part, you wrote the script, you wrote the book, um, you had a story, we'll take it from here. Because I think in this new world of multi-platforms, being able to tell that story in so many different ways and so many different angles, you really got to partner with the creators that you, you that yeah. are creating that IP. Absolutely, and I, I actually had a, uh, not so good experience once, uh, and I've kind of learned along the way and the importance of making sure that the creatives are a part of the IP and a part of developing various strategies around that is, so I uh, acted and produced in a Canadian film five years ago called um, um, Dr. Cabby. And Dr. Cabby was a story about a young immigrant doctor from India who uh, can't practice here and he starts to drive a cab and he starts to create a illegal underground clinic out of the back of his cab. Uh, film did very well in Canada, and actually we probably did better by selling the various remake rights to China, Spain, uh, I mean, all over the world, we basically sold these remake rights. But uh, one of the mistakes I made is is I never um, put it in my contracts to be a part of that. And, and, and I kind of felt like I was out of the process. And to be honest with you, um, our, our team was just sort of sitting on the sidelines while our properties were being, you know, adapted for their own countries, which is right. And I totally get that sensibility, but it would have just been great to be a part of that room to just say, Hey, look, these were the mistakes that we made. And, and this is how we can kind of correct those things. So I think it's really important to just make sure that you are protected and, um, and, and just being 
uh, collaborative and you never want to get in the way, but you just, but if you've created something and put a lot of heart and energy into it. Um, and now that I've been on both sides, I think it's very, very important to have the original creators in the room. Right. Before I go to Ray, I'm going to go to our resident lawyer here, Aaron, like how do, I'm sure people approach you to, to help with this, um, protecting their IP or their, their rights. Um, what, what would your recommendations be in terms of uh, what to look out for? So it, it's an interesting theme that, that we're hearing, uh, hearing here. I think that when you create or when you produce um, early on in your career, you do want to think about um, the monetization of the IP from creation all the way through to exploitation and the 16 windows that might exist beyond, right? And I think what we see a lot is uh, creators, producers giving up um, or being asked to give up virtually all of their rights right from development, right? So some some broadcasters are taking full, requiring full distribution rights to their affiliated distribution companies right from development. And that just, it, it just completely um, strong arms you with what you can do down the road. So we, we push really hard against that. Not easy to do, um, especially when you're starting out in your career, right? When you're new and you're, you're still trying to prove yourself and you're just trying to get that deal done. Um, sometimes you have to plug your nose and just get the deal done. And then the next one looks a little bit better and the next one looks a little bit better than that. But um, my advice is always think about what's best for the project and what's best for your company right from creation all the way through. And then you can try to strategize about it and who the best partners are. I think what what Erin and Vinay were both saying is find the right partners. Um, you were saying partnership's important, but if people aren't finding the two of you, um, others may not have that same view about how important the partnership is with the creator producer right, right from the, the outset. So that's, that's kind of my broad recommendation. It is not easy. Uh, for for producers starting out for sure um, and like I said you may have to do a stinky deal the first time but then the next one gets better and the next one gets better after that it does get better <laughs> out there it's 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 a bit of a grind but I think the beauty of this business is that you're always learning and and um, you know every project you just get a bit smarter and you learn how to cover your faces a little better but it definitely does get better Sometimes you gotta butt the bullet at first. Yeah. yeah absolutely yep. right. Absolutely. Any, any advi advice from you, Ray, in terms of your experience, uh, just building on what the others have said? Honestly, just call Aaron Finley. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> this was not about getting Aaron new clients. Come on. <laughs> but to be honest with you, it's you have to identify the skills you don't have and what you need to bring to the table as Vinay and Aaron mentioned, you got to look for partners who, who's going to be able to do that and protect you. But um, other than that, it's honestly execution. Like ideas are a dime a dozen. You can create as many option agreements and secure, you know, as much protection. But it honestly, it's, it's your go-to market strategy and it's execution. And if it doesn't work one way, you pivot, try it another way. And bringing people to the table that can really fuel that idea and turn it into a value, into a property a value and you have to bring skill sets to the table that you don't possess. If I don't, you know, possess the creative direction, you got to bring someone that brings that to the table. If you are tackling a certain subject, you got to bring a pioneer that specializes in that. Um, otherwise, you know, you're not going to get the investment that you need in order for it to, to come to light. So identify what you don't know and just bring the right talent to the table and execute. And, Other and, and I'll also add just one other point to that. I know we're talking about content, but these days IP can just mean so much more than just content. And having transitioned from the feature film or to sort of a digital first uh, studio now, um, for example, we're doing a show right now, which is a um, financial series where we talk to athletes about money and, and talk to them about lessons they've learned with money. And now we find that it's gone from a unscripted digital show to possibly live events to an entire series on um, financial literacy to books to this to that so it's also really really important to these days not only think of content just as in a small content bucket but that ip can become a whole world a whole ecosystem in itself and and that's i think really an, just such an exciting opportunity right now is things that i'm trying to look for as a producer now is things that are more than just 
content? What is the entire ecosystem? So that's another way on how I'm changing my outlook on, on all this. Yeah. To add to, just that. to add to that, like it's, it's funny, those rights used to be the ones you're like, okay, we'll freeze them or <laughs> theme park, who's gonna make a theme park? Um, and more and more, those are the ones that you're now fighting over because um, when you're looking at monetizing IP, whatever you define IP is, as, it's getting harder and harder to make your dollar on just a feature film or just a series, you know, especially with streamers and how they, you know, are owning global rights on things. Um, so you really have to be smarter and treat each piece of IP, whatever IP is defining as a business unto itself. And how are you going to make sure you have, you know, multiple ways to make, uh, make money from that, that property. And that, you know, all goes back. It has to start with a great creative core, but you can't separate the business thinking of every story. And, you know, right to your point, there's a million great stories out there. So which ones are going to have, lives and so many different continuums that we can now produce it yeah to your to both your points think outside you know the netflix and the amazon there wasn't netflix or amazon before but like I'll, one example is a master class that could have been a content series on trade secrets these you know celebrities and they could have pitched that to netflix or amazon and it would have been a great series but they just created their own platform. And now in order to access those trade secrets, you have to download this masterclass or subscribe to the masterclass, right. but that's its own intellectual property. I think they just raised a hundred million dollars at an $800 million valuation, which has a much, you know, much longer shelf life and longevity than if it were to sit on a Netflix or Amazon that's saturated with so much other, um, you know, pieces of content that could be. It speaks to the discoverability factor too. We do have a question coming in. So uh, if I can pivot to that from Heather, um, she says, when it comes to IP, what percentage is typical for individual creators to own uh, when it comes to a deal with a network and what would be a good deal for a creator in terms of percentage ownership? Erin Finley, can I throw that one to you? You see all those oh, deals. Heather, every deal's a snowflake. <laughs> um, what, what, what we're seeing uh, for a typical broadcast deal, we're kind of looking at somewhere between 8 to 18, 20% of uh, financing of the budget. Um, I will not say that that's good. It's lower than it used to be. Um, but that is kind of seems to be the... Uh, the ballpark for at least for the private broadcasters. If you're doing a deal with CBC, it's a little higher um, than that. The streamers range really all over the place, but I think it was Aaron, you, you made the point earlier that there will always be a, a rights grab for global online rights with the streamer. So you can expect to, to give away all of the um, all of the IP at the front end with most of the US streamers. Anyone else have any thoughts on percentage or does that make sense what Aaron was saying? I think it does depend now so much, you know, with Netflix reintroducing a new model into the system and now everyone, you know, how Disney Plus is doing things or Hulu is doing things can be different than how a local streamer in Indonesia is doing things. It isn't a one size fits all. I think, you know, it also depends where you are in that process, right? Did you write a novel and are you getting it adapted? Do you write a screenplay? Or are you getting it adapted for your producer who found a screenplay and getting that? So it's really, uh, to Aaron's point, like you don't want to say everything's a snowflake, um, but it is. It also depends on where you are in your career, right? I think, you know, Ray, I can't remember who said, you know, sometimes that first one isn't your best one, um, but it's the reality that, you know, I think, I'm up against all the time is like, how do you break into new markets? And sometimes you do things that are not the best uh, for that specific property, but we can look at that creator and say, your career we're creating, this is a trajectory for it. So I think it's just important that as you get into the deal, know why you're taking that deal more than just saying, oh, this is standard, or this is great, or this is bad. You get a great percentage of ownership um, and have that still be a bad deal. So it, it's just understanding where it fits in the trajectory of your career. Right, and part of your strategy is building partnerships, and sometimes you, you that's the number one goal, right? So interesting. Um, we have another question um, from Leah. How early on do you suggest signing co-production agreements? Does anybody want to take that one? Uh, depends who's it with. I mean, depend who it's with. Like what? Uh, 
Are, He's are, an example. Are looking, He's an example. Are you looking for another production partner? I mean, I've been at all different various stages of my career. I mean, early on as a writer, somebody with a script, sometimes you need a bigger entity so you get into it right away. I mean, I'm, I'm but uh, yeah, just love maybe a little more detail as to what co-production uh, exactly are you. Okay, working? well maybe uh, Leo will give us more more detail about her scenario there. Um, so we're in a new new world. Uh, not sure it's the new normal, the next normal that's coming, but has the shutdown um, affected how you've uh, thought about strategies and is that, do you, are you just barreling ahead as normal or are there silver linings? Or are there pivots that you, that you've had to, had to uh, consider? Aaron, what about Wattpad? Um, so obviously things have changed. Uh, but I think the interesting thing that happened during the shutdown is all those people who said they always wanted to read are actually reading. And what I mean is actors, directors, producers were not on set. And, you know, we would get requests constantly from, you know, celebrity X or director Y that says, yeah, I'd love to read some stuff, but we know we send it over and assistant reads it and it doesn't go much past that. So there was a vast move globally we saw, I mean, over developing in 10 languages with 15 partners around the world, everyone went into development. And, you know, we're fortunate that, you know, with 500 million plus uploads to the platform, we can really you know, put fuel on the fire of development. So we transferred from only thinking, like pushing everything to green light as, as far as we could, because green lights, frankly, were harder to come by in this era and really shifting towards development, which is totally IP driven. It was going back to understanding what was important in film in France and what was important to horror series in the US. And we got to dive back in and research our own content again, which is always a great moment for creators like ourselves to go work with our creators again. So I think that was probably the biggest shift that we found in this time. You know, we saw some genres pop up that were cool, like, you know, quarantine romances. Um, the writer of The Kissing Booth, uh, mm. the film on Netflix, actually, I think the second one comes out very shortly. Uh, Beth wrote the original on Wattpad, has been a Wattpad writer forever and started writing this story called Lo uh, Lockdown in London Lane, which is how do people fall in love during quarantine? So. That was kind of fun to see also that, you know, in a moment of catharsis where people really needed an outlet, people are sharing new universes they want to fall in love with. So in between development and some new genres coming out, um, I'm being told people can't hear me. So uh, I think with both the, um, you know, increased development and some new kind of storytelling coming out, it was actually a pretty exciting time for us. Ray, how about you? Has this time been uh, changed your perspective? Uh, absolutely. A lot of just self-reflecting and how we're pivoting for just the new world of human behavior. I think, you know, as, as there's a shift in human behavior, I think everyone needs to discuss strategies on how we're going to cater to that human behavior. So much like from TV channel surfing to now you channel surf through social media, like your networks now are not the, you know, ABC, CBC, and like those, those are not the big networks. Now it's the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the YouTube and Snapchats and how we're consuming content it has, has shifted. So um, it's, it's thinking how we're tapping into that new human behavior, but also COVID-19 has, you know, shifted human behavior. Now, you know, we're limited to activities that we can do. And when we think about production, um, I, you know, I believe the, the ones that don't require a big production, skeleton, skeleton crews are going to um, get greenlit faster than, you know, big production. And what does that say about like the big Hollywood action film releases? Like, is, is, is that going to be on a decline while your, um, your documentary style and more DIY style content increases? So it's just thinking about what we're limited to. Um, but I think it's also, I think being in Canada, it's, it's a huge advantage for us because like LA just shut down. I know Jurassic World's halted production five days ago, but our cases aren't nearly as high as it is in LA or New York. And right now we're limited to 10 people on set, but come Friday, 
Uh, I think that will increase to like 50 to 100 outdoors. So there's a lot more flexibility in terms of shooting within Canada. And if all, all our great Canadian talent, like, you know, the filmmakers and musicians are quarantined within Canada and we're limited to only being within our country instead of traveling and self-isolating for 14 days, I think we need to capitalize on the talent we have here who, who are stuck here and, and take advantage as well as of the Canadian dollar. Um, I think it's like per US dollar to dollar 40. So, I mean, there's a lot of incentives within Canada that I, we're taking a look at and trying to use that to, to you know, our advantage. How about you, Vinay? Have you guys shifted? Yes. I, I've sort of uh, lived live two lives, right? I live one on the bigger feature film side, the sort of five to $12 million feature film uh, independent world. And then I have obviously my digital uh, sports world that I do. Um, it's going to, and I don't want to sound pessimistic, but for independent features, it's going to get really hard. I know we're fighting insurance companies all the time. We're fighting bond companies all the time. Um, you know, the amount of PPEs that are going to need it on set, all the different protocols that are going to come in. Look, it is, it is going to be hard. And, and like I had a film that we were scheduled to shoot fall 2020. Um, you know, uh, we've already gone over budget without even doing anything by uh, a crazy amount of money. I don't even want to tell you how much. Uh, the actors that we were uh, planning on getting in the film, I'm on the phone with their agents and they're saying, well, they're going back to their series now, so see you next spring, you know? So already I've taken a year delay on, on that movie now. So, you know, uh, the situation there will take some time. It'll probably take some, a little bit more federal government support uh, to get our independent Canadian feature world back going. Um, so that's one side of it, but that still means, look, still reading lots of scripts and definitely finding uh, some great voices. On the uninterrupted side, actually, you know, again, because the crews are smaller, because sports documentaries rely on a bit more um, archival, I can shoot with less than five people. We're actually in production right now on um, two different documentaries right now. So that's already happening and that's going on. Uh, we'll do really well on those on those sports docs. But the other thing that we've been doing is really investing in a lot of digital short form IP. Um, having a call out to lots of young creators out there is because I feel like the beauty of where we are right now is that the digital IP space, it's almost like a testing ground. Um, it's not a big investment. It's a couple thousand bucks to just try a format and see if it works. Um, you know, case in point being one of, one of, one of the formats that I'm so jealous of is, uh, something like that show um, Hot Wings. I don't know if anybody's seen that show on Complex where celebrities eat hot wings as they get interviewed. So it was a digital show, um, you know, 15, 20 minute digital show that's now packaged for linear television. They're doing hot sauces now out of it. They're doing cooking things out of it. And again, going back to the whole ecosystem. Um, so that's a lot of where my focus has been is, is investing in young creators because I feel in Canada that we can nurture the careers for uh, less risk in terms of money is finding really, really great digital formats that can be exported globally, that can be formatted globally, and uh, hopefully gives us as a country things that we can really own and kind of take to the world. Because I think more than ever, we're, we should all be thinking of a Canada first strategy right now. Excellent. I'm um, just going to turn to the Q&A for a minute. Um, We've got a question here. Is it common for independent producers to own any IP if they're helping a creator develop the creator's own series concept, concept i.e. helping build the series Bible tone, world episodes, etc.? Does the producer own any IP at that stage? Anybody want to take that one? Erin Finley, maybe? Maybe. Um <laughs> depends on the deal that that you've struck with the with the creator right um that's, that's is, it, is it recommended that at that stage i always recommend to my clients that they retain a piece of the ip however they can get it because i think everything we've talked about today is about that ecosystem to Vinay's point um 
the the ecosystem that keeps keeps feeding feeding the machine, right? So if, if you're a part of the creation, if you're part of the production, the development of the project, um, I think that owning a piece of the IP, and that can look like many different things, but owning, you know, a revenue share, profit sharing, um, a royalty stream, uh, you know, having licensing rights, all of those things are about owning a piece of the IP. Um, I do think it's appropriate if if you're involved in in any step of the way when it comes to producers. Um, just going to go to another question. Building off of Aaron Aaron's Wattpad Aaron's comment that Wattpad uses consumer insights to develop great content that's tailored to their readers. Question for Ray and Benet: What strategies do you use to maximize the value of your content? Do you have any tactics you use to determine what content will resonate before production begins, i.e. data, market research, et cetera? Um, Ray? Go ahead, Ray. Sorry, Vinay? Ray? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Uh, in terms of data, there's so many platforms out there that give you consumer insight. I mean, Wattpad Studios is a great example. They, like, they've built a robust technology where they're able to just even adapt you know, instantly. Um, unfortunately, we haven't built a platform of that nature, but we're relying on technologies or similar technologies like that to consume data inside. But I, I think you, you have to identify first, you know, the story you want to tell or the subject you want to tell or the piece of art you want to tell. And then really understand like your demographic, your audience, and where do they consume that content or where would they consume that content for? And then you have to like, cater it to either if it's through vertical stories or Quibi versus YouTube, like what's going to be the best catered platform for the story you want to tell. Um, in terms of research, there's like, I can name you a bunch of different platforms we're using, but that it, it's very time consuming in terms of trying to research the data of, you know, the demographic you're trying to cater to and where they're consuming that content. But I think identifying your story, knowing, um, knowing the platform you want to cater onto and just identifying the partners that you need to bring to the table in order for you to deploy it and for it to be a success are the most important uh, elements for me. Vinay, your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, our, our business model is a bit different. Um, although we have uh, a very large number of followers on the uninterrupted platform within Canada, we are still a new platform. Uh, that's why it was very important and very strategic for us to align with Bell, um, which now has amplified our audience. So again, we get asked these questions all the time from potential sponsors and brand deals wanting to know our audience size or our you know metrics. And, and, and again, we're able to demonstrate them with what the uninterrupted following is in Canada, what the athletes following is in Canada, as well as Bell and through TSN. So we're able to put together a really good package. But, you know, really, I just want to say that the content that has worked for us, it's, it's worked because it's just authentic and it's just real. And, and, and again, how we approach content from such a pure place where our, our athletes are our partners, um, a lot of our content, first and foremost, is, is geared towards their fan base. And it's presenting new sides of that athlete um, beyond just the sport. Um, so really that's what it is, 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 is we try to align the athletes with the right filmmakers um, that just come from a very authentic place. And really that's sort of being our secret sauce. And going back to someone's question on co-production, like if I needed to cater content to that audience of athletes and I needed to attach athletes to the story I want to tell right away, I'm calling Vinay and that's going to be a co-production I'm going to think of you know, instantly. So uh, to go back to bringing the people on that, you know, add value to what it is that you're doing and finding that co-production partner, um, the sooner you identify what value they can add, the sooner you can have those discussions and, and uh, you know, partner with them. Okay, we're we're into the sort of a Q and A part of the uh, of the webinar, so keep the questions coming. Uh, we do have one on a really timely subject. Um, how is the Canadian film and television business dealing with the much needed and necessary advance of racial equity? When you folks look at uh, content you're um, wanting to produce, 
Um, are you helping advance those issues? Finney, we'll turn it to you. Absolutely. I mean, obviously you, but you do. Uh, <laughs> I've been at a, a number of real Canada screenings of uh, Breakaway and Dr. Cabby, and uh, those are pretty, pretty amazing, so. I mean, I, again, I had to uh, work to create those opportunities for myself, um, you know, and, and really put a level of risk to say, how do I want myself and my community to be represented on screen? Um, look, the reality is, is that we, we do have a huge systematic problem. Um, in the 10 years that I've been in the business, I have never once sat across from executive that looks anything remotely like me. Um, or, 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 or can share any of my experience or, you know, and, and that's something that's very, very concerning. Um, and I, and I'm so happy that we're finally having these conversations, um, you know, and, uh, and I think that one thing that at uninterrupted, um, you know, we're really proud to be nurturing the careers and, and finding young filmmakers that feel alienated from our Canadian system. And, and the reality is that there are, there's a tremendous amount of talent in this country that just feels completely disheartened by the walls that have been put up that they cannot break into these major networks or uh, different, you know, film funding institutions. So, um, you know, uh, that's been a big mandate for us is aligning athletes with the right filmmakers to tell their stories and, and just finding so much new talent in terms of directing, editing, uh, music composition, um, so many different ways. So that's a big, big, big mandate for us. Aaron, do you want to take that one in terms of Wattpad and how you're approaching those issues? Yeah, for sure. And, and I'll come at it from two different perspectives here. First of all, it's something audiences are demanding now too, you know, and, and so when the same 10 gatekeepers have told us all what to watch really globally for 150 years of film and TV and in publishing even longer, 400 years, um, apparently my, my, I'm still too soft, so I'll, hopefully this helps. Um, you know, it's important to understand that audiences are truly um, expecting us to produce content from different backgrounds, different points of views. They want to understand how people fall in love, not two white kids in a mall in the middle of America. We've seen that a million times. Like, how does love happen in Indonesia and how does love happen in Italy? And so it is bringing different people from different backgrounds to the forefront. And at Wattpad, that's been a really important part for us. It's being able to work with great uh, own voice writers all over the world to make sure their stories are being told. And, and we treat that very importantly when you look at the mix of content that we are producing or publishing is we make sure we are elevating own voices and not just you know the writers of the stories, but the editors we're using. Uh, the sensitivity readers we're using, the directors, the screenwriters that we partner with, because we have to make sure, you know, to Vinay's point, it's not just people on screen, it's the entire ecosystem of the industry that I think we have massive responsibility to support uh, in changing right now. I just yeah, want to add, I just want to- Decision makers are, are pretty key that has to change. Yeah, Sorry about and that. I just, want, I just want to add one quick thing that even I think what I'm so happy about right now is I think that the filmmaker itself is also part of the story and part of the narrative too now. You know, when I'm looking for, whether it's a feature script or short form digital stuff or documentaries, whatever it may be, uh, the filmmaker itself has to be part of the overall project narrative for me now. It's, it's not just, hey, okay, this is a good script and let's go to this guy who's made those five movies before because he fits that genre. No, it's about finding, making sure that the makers are aligned with that script. I think right. that's it's, a yeah, really good the, point. The rise oh, sorry, of the Liz. show, the, just saying the rise of the showrunner, right? And, you know, now a lot of our members, you know, you don't pitch only as a producer, you've got to take the creators along. Which yeah, is and, 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 and just lastly, I mean, like you said, it has to start within the writing room. It has to start on the page. I mean, I can't tell you how many things 
I've auditioned for as an actor where somebody's trying to write for a South Asian character. And I'm like, and I can read it on the page and say, this is the most, we don't talk like this. My father does not talk like this, you know? Um, and, and that's what's going to need to change. I mean, we need to stop circulating the same old showrunner list that's been going on for 25 years in this country at all the major networks. Okay, you're planning a half hour comedy. Here you go, pick from these 20 showrunners. That needs to change. We need to take risks on new voices um, on all levels. And, and that's the only way where I think our content is going to, is going to go to the world, um, you know, uh, and, and I think that's, I think that's the thing that we have to really think about in Canada is, is, is how do we start to export our content to the world? How do we find a global audience? If you look at the BBC, they've done that very successfully. You know, I give the BBC a lot of credit because they've always included so many diverse voices in, in the uh, shows that they, that they uh, green light. So I think, I think we really need to study that. Ray, do you want to weigh in on this one? No, to Vinay's point, I mean, our audience can smell bullshit like a mile away. <laughs> it all comes down to well, authenticity. And, you know, my co-founder, Maurizio, he, he always says, hey, it needs to be authentic. If it's not authentic, like, we shouldn't try to, you know, <laughs> try to try to do it because it's, it's just going to come across as fake. And the 410 is a great example of that. Super is the creator um, and the lead talent within that series who has ownership, the director, Renica, um, also is from, south, from the Southeast um, Asian community. So these are, it's a Southeast Asian story that is, you know, that is driven by those that are from that culture, that understand that culture and who can tell an authentic story. Um, so, I mean, that's a prime example of it, the, the, the authenticity has to reflect the ownership of whatever it is that uh, you know we're creating. Absolutely, I think that's the secret to successful IP is is especially right now is making it authentic and kind of write what you know. And and Liz, you're very kind to well to to mention my film Breakaway. I mean, the reason why I think it achieved so much success and it has screened over 150 high schools a year and is chosen by the government to welcome new immigrants and refugees. And it's, it's, it has survived for the last nine years is because it was a group of Indian boys that created that story. Um, you know, we wrote about our real life experiences uh, growing up Indo-Canadian and what those challenges were. So um, I think it's such an exciting time right now for um, diverse creatives just to develop uh, their own content, their own, their own IPs. And what we've done internally, like, I think the industry is just so used to working with, you know, the go-to filmmakers, the go, like, they just have their go-tos, it's just easier. And there's not as much of a push to discover more diverse talent and take chances on more diverse talent. Uh, and we've been at fault, we, like, we've been used to working with our go-to creators, but we've implemented a system which needs a lot of work, but we started implementing a system we're, we're trying to discover new talent from the BIPOC community. So I think we just need to double down on discovering new talent and get out of your comfort zone and start working with new people and not stay in your box. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to, you know, increase the diversity of storytelling. It's just, you need to, to, to increase your discovery models. That's intention for sure. Um, okay, I'm looking in the, Q and A don't see much there. So I'm going to go to the go-to, which I always do near the end of a session, which is, um, is there any kind of failure or success story that you want to share um, as we get ready to close this session? Is there one, one learning around IP, bring it back to IP that um, you want to share to say, oops, just as an example, don't do this or do this? Vinay, you got one? You kind of touched on one earlier. Yeah, actually, I just want to take on one quick thing that somebody wrote that saying okay. that, so are you saying someone, uh, someone not from a community cannot and shouldn't make a story on something non-white, for example? Sorry, I uh, missed that one. Yeah, yeah and, and no, I'm not, I don't, I, I mean, I don't think that at all. Uh, my co-writer on both Breakaway and Dr. Cabby were not Indian, uh, you know, so I'm not saying that at all. Actually, I think what it is, it's about having responsibility to make sure that that voice is represented in your project. That's, that's, that's I think, where, where we need to come to, is that if you're planning a series or a character based on a specific ethnicity, just make sure that that representation is there. 
um, to make sure that things are crafted carefully and you know, and that and that you get the essence of that culture or that character right. I think I think that's what it is. Right. If, just to expand on that, I mean, it's about creating a three D character, right? Don't mm -hmm. use someone's background as a trope just to fill in a United, you know, Benetton's ad. There's a three Dness to every character that should be in your story to be great storytelling, and that does mean partnering with people. You know, it does mean partnering with an own voice who's lived that experience. Um, and that may mean giving up some ownership of your IP in the early days. And that's okay. Because if you are committed to creating amazing content with an authentic voice, that's what we all do. We give away that ownership and that should be something you're happy to give away in the early days to help support new voices coming into an industry that's been plagued without them for so long. Absolutely. Aaron, can I turn, Aaron Finley, can I turn to you? What do you see in terms of do's and don'ts? Just, uh, are, is there a common, uh, oh man, all these people are do, you know, missing something when they're um, trying to retain rights or what, is there something common? Um, I think that the most common mistake is not thinking about the full life of a project or the full potential of a project and not to fault anyone because this is not easy stuff and it comes with experience. Um, but I think what you're hearing from everyone around the Zoom table um, is uh, thinking about it from conception all the way through to exploitation. And like I said, you know, eight windows down the road. We don't know what the industry is going to look like tomorrow, much less a year from now. You know, did Wattpad know that its self-publishing platform was going to turn into a, a feature film studio? Maybe, maybe you did, Aaron. Um, but when I first heard of Wattpad, I had no idea. So <laughs> I think, you know, being open to it, thinking through possibilities um, it is, is the way to approach it. Maybe try not to take the first deal that comes across your desk, or at least the second time don't do the same first deal. Um, I think that would be kind of my general advice when it comes to the IP. Any other final words of uh, advice or? To Aaron, or don't? Right? To Aaron's point, I think, I mean, don't be afraid of sweat equity. I mean, the further you get along bootstrapping a project, putting your own sweat equity in, you don't have to, you know, partner with someone who can add capital right away. I think Code 8 is a perfect example of, you know, they did a short film, they bootstrapped it with their own money, and, uh, you know, they, they gave people points to create a proof of concept. Um, then they raised money through Indiegogo. I think their target was like 200K, and they were able to reach 2.4 million. They then closed a round of funding at like 3.4, but that's just through Indiegogo. They gave all the, you know, people who helped finance it credits and um, obviously different packages, but they were able to take a proof of concept, turn it into an Indiegogo campaign, raise that money through fans, then sell that to Netflix. And now I think they just did a deal with, with Quibi. But I mean, the, the further along you bootstrap it, um, and the more creative you can get into making it without seeking, you know, capital right away, um, better it is. Yeah, and I think there's just, it. I was just going to say it, it, it doesn't mean IP doesn't mean you have to create a project. Like you can work, I'll give you an example, but unrelated to film, like I think Facebook was like, they asked a graffiti artist to paint their office space and he was going to charge $60,000, but Sean Parker convinced him to take shares instead. And that was a piece of IP owned with his sweat equity. And that $60,000 turned into like $200 million in stock. So it doesn't really have to be something you create, but you can put your sweat equity into someone else that's creating. So as long as you believe in their vision and you're like, you know what, I'm going to do it for points. I mean, it, it, the reward can come, you know, uh, at a much longer time, but um, yeah, I mean, just want to end there. But yeah. Sorry. Well, that's okay. sweat equity. Um, inspiring. Again, I just, just one last, I don't, I don't think it's enough to just have an idea anymore. I, do, I just don't think like a good idea sells in the room anymore. And, and just to raise point is, you know, everybody is packaging their projects and bringing so much to the table 
I've seen sizzle reels of stuff and I've seen it. I'm like, did you go out and shoot this? And like, no, we just put it together with found footage and YouTube footage. And, and, you know, so it's, it's, and, and like, just don't be afraid to keep doing the work because, and again, as packaged as you think you are, there's a hundred people out there that have it even more elevated or to a different stage. And I'm not saying you need money to go and fund that. You just need to think outside the box and say, okay, how do we, how do we present this idea? So it looks like the safest bet possible. And, 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 that, and that the creative just jumps off the page now. Great, well, I'm gonna have to close it there and I'm gonna throw it back to Melanie. But before I do that, I wanna thank uh, Aaron Finley, Aaron Levitz, Ray Mendoza and Vinay Vermani for a great discussion.